environments. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So my name is Maximilian Bauer. Uh, me and my colleagues uh, from the Technical University of Darmstadt conducted a little, a little analysis of the helicopter flights in urban environment with the purpose to support UAV traffic management. And um, yeah, as many of you might know, the number of UAVs is increasing. Um, it is even expected to triple from the commercial side within the years 2020 to 2025. It, of course, depends on who you are asking. Um, but the commercial UAV operations um, are mostly of a highly automated nature. They are also um, operating beyond visual line of sight and they're operating in an altitude below 120 meters above ground. And on the other side, we also see an increase in the number of rescue missions by helicopter and emergency medical services in Germany, USA, and Japan, but also in other nations. And these uh, HEMS missions are of unscheduled nature because you never know when an emergency happens and then they have to fly out. And they are also of high priority and they play a special role in this very low level airspace because they can basically fly anywhere and also land anywhere. So beside of a highway, on a field, uh, and that is not prior known to departure. So with these both operators operating in the very low level airspace, this of course imposes some conflicts because they are sharing an airspace uh, with the HEMS having a higher priority than the UAV of course. And today's regulation just state that UAV pilots or UAV in general should give way to manned aviation. That's it. Um, no more specification. In the future, there are a couple of uh, concepts that should be implemented. There's a so-called use space where they uh, rely on some infrastructure to enable communication, also an interface to ATC. But HEMS will always have a special role because uh, of their very unscheduled nature, because of their high priority. And even in these concepts, um, the HEMS should also be uh, yeah, treated special. Um, and yeah, all the other ones should give way to these helicopters and emergency medical services. Um, which leads us to the questions, well, there are some HEMS operating today. Uh, maybe we can find out more about them using ADSB data and then help to separate these HEMS and UAVs. So to kind of bridging the gap between future concepts and the way it is today. And to tackle these questions, um, we followed uh, this approach. Of course, we need to extract and process some data about HEMS and then analyze these HEMS missions and try to find some patterns, just something that is maybe special to these uh, missions, something that we can use. Um, to characterize them, to say, well, if um, an aircraft is behaving like that, then it's, it's probably a HEMS mission. And within these HEMS missions, also, maybe there are some different categories. Um, also, keeping in mind that if we can categorize a HEMS mission in certain categories, we are able to match the life behavior of a HEMS helicopter and therefore predict with a certain reliability um, the future behavior of that helicopter. And if we can do that, we can predict the future to a little extent, then we can restrict the airspace for UAV operations very efficiently, only uh, the airspace the helicopter will need, of course. Um, as this would be uh, way too much for, for a work or for a nine limit uh, page paper, uh, we focused on the first part to really say uh, what is the benefit of the ADSB data. Is there really something in there that can be used? So try to find the potential, try to find a very clean and reliable data set to uh, have some further work on specifying the strategies. Um, but, but you will see um, in the end. So, of course, we need some data sources, and of course, we use the Open Sky Network to extract um, our data. And we focused on a special helicopter model, namely the Airbus EC135, which is the main um, HEMS helicopter in Germany. So, this HEMS system in Germany is that there are a couple of stations um, across Germany, mostly associated with a hospital, and then there are some other hospitals with helipads. Um, and this uh, 
Airbus E337 is exclusively used at these stations. So um, the problem is that they not all carry ADSB. There are a couple of newer helicopters who are having ADSB, otherwise we wouldn't have no data. And we identified them via the ICAO24 identifier. Um, yeah, after extracting the data from the um, database, we filtered for valid flights, and we also tried to remove outliers. So, for example, altitudes um, beyond 10,000 feet, also uh, ground speeds over 180 knots, etc. We tried to um, identify flights from start to end. So sometimes the flight ID was not um, really associated with a real flight, so we had to um, yeah, reshape there a little bit. And that was it from the Open Sky Network data. And then we, like I mentioned, we had these HEMS stations and also the hospital heliports. And there we used some uh, data that is available by the uh, uh, federal agency for cartography and geodesy. And we filtered just within the Berlin city center because we applied our approach only to Berlin as there were, yeah, as we thought, the most qualitative data available. And they also have a couple of hospitals with helipads on it and a uh, hemp station. So this was we, we, what we considered uh, the right environment to um, yeah, test this approach. Uh, like I said, the area of Berlin uh, we also used, and we used the Uber H3 definition system to have some hexagonal cells to have a better structure of the um, environment. And we additionally enriched the data with the elevation data using Copernicus um, elevation data to get the real uh, height above ground. As I said, this is important for UAV operations as they are limited to 120 meters. And this is uh, yeah, a first view of the overall filtered data. Uh, you can see the 30 kilometer radius around the Berlin city center. We had initially more than 2 million uh, measurements from um, which we removed more than 40 percent um, and still had over 3,200 flights. And of all these flights, over 80 percent uh, were um, executed by one helicopter, by one registration, uh, which is the Christoph 31 station. So, okay. which is this station here. Um, and it's just the name of the station. And it's also the helipad of the Charité in Berlin. This is the biggest hospital in Berlin. Um, and as you might see with the color of, on this map, um, oh, <laughs> I hope it gets better. Um, uh, yeah, the color indicates the number of landings. So basically just the location of the last data point in the flight. And uh, what's really interesting or what's uh, good uh, that our helipads, the blue dots here, the hospital with the helipads and also our station um, are the hotspots where the most landing happened. This is of course great as is what you would expect. Uh, but what's also interesting is that there are landings from these helicopters all around Berlin. So they're actually landing everywhere, and this is not easy for to, to predict. Um, and to make some more sense out of the data, uh, we thought, okay, well, we look at the flights, and we try to categorize the flights um, or classify them by a rule-based filter. So first we say, okay, we have this geofence around Berlin, and now we take a look at the starting and the end point, um, and yeah, we have within area starting in the geofence, ending in the geofence, transit, uh, starting outside the geofence, ending outside the geofence, uh, outbound and inbound, also self-explanatory um, to have a look at yeah, what's happening in the geofence actually. And then we filtered for the flight segment. Uh, very easy, just take of cruise and landing. And we tuned our filter individual, individually for our data uh, based on rate of climb, altitude, maximum altitude, uh, and the ground speed, so it was tuned by hand to have for us sufficient uh, classification as this is not always that easy. And then one more important thing that we add is the so-called HEMS segment. Um, as you've seen on the previous slide, there are these stations and there are outside landings. And we thought, well, what's, what's behind that? Um, and we assume that uh, a helicopter starts at a hospital or station and then flies to a patient and then maybe flies back. 
So we try to categorize uh, where the helicopter starts and where it's flying and call this the HEM segment. Um, as the, uh, like uh, Alan said, uh, the ADSB coverage on ground is not the best. Sometimes the first data point of the flight was not um, exactly on the hospital or something. Though we need to have a buffer zone around that hospital, uh, which we said, okay, well, if it's starting there or it's landing there, we associate this takeoff or landing um, to the station or hospital. And for the patient, it's similar. Of course, we don't know where the patient is, but we assume it is something near uh, the landing spot of the helicopter. But we also had some unknown points. So if a helicopter landed outside, so not near a hospital or station, and then it flies somewhere and also lands in the, in the nowhere, well, we don't know what, what is that. Yeah, was it a patient or something? So we also have the category unknown to unknown, so something that we can't categorize. And this leads us to the following plot. Um, yeah, you can see the flights there. Uh, but what's interesting is that 78.5% um, of all the classified flights are within the area. So we assume that our geofence around Berlin has the right size. Uh, we also find out that from these uh, 3,200 flights, most of the flights were actually from station or hospital to a patient and back. So these were over 2,100s. And we had a very low number of unknown to unknown flights. So our buffer zones and our flight segment filters actually worked quite well, only 170. Um, what's also very interesting is that there is a significant number of flights below 120 meters. Of course, it depends on how you process the data, but um, this really shows that there um, is a conflict between the operational volume of drones and the operational volume of HAMS. Um, maybe it's not that of a problem right now as the drones uh, are not operating in that uh, many numbers, but it will. Um, also very interesting, as we looked at consecutive flights and classified them as missions, we found out that um, yeah, 800, more than 800 missions were only one leg, uh, then 600 missions were probably these uh, patient to, uh, station to patient and patient back uh, flights. Then we also had some flights with three legs, so three consecutive flights, and then also some four and five. And after having prepared uh, the data like this, we now take a look at individual flights. And maybe you can also see here, so the color indicates the ground speed. Uh, yellow is yeah, very slow and blue is very high. That there are these uh, star-like uh, missions taking place. There are some cross connections here. There are some interesting uh, patterns uh, on the outside landing. And to work further on that, we look at individual flights and individual missions. And this leads us to identifying three typical missions. One is the so-called triangle flight. So this is the mission uh, using three legs. And we have here indicated in um, green the takeoff, in red the uh, landing, and in blue the cruise. And you can see that um, a triangle flight consists of starting at a station, where the helicopter is stationed, and then flying towards the patient, landing there, picking up the patient, flying him to a hospital, and then flying from the hospital back to the station. We also found that um, there are aborted missions. So the helicopter starting uh, where he was stationed, then flying out to probably where a patient was or where something was happening, where the HEMS was needed, and then probably um, got the abortion of the mission and then returned in a high degree turn back to the station. And then we have the third category of mission, um, which is, like I already um, teasered, uh, the most common one, uh, flying from the station or helipad to the patient, picking him up, and then flying back. So the question is now how we can use this information to yeah, help um, UAV uh, traffic management, and therefore we wanted to find out, well, what are the differences between those missions? How can we maybe add metrics or numbers that really help in um, yeah, restricting airspace in a manner that is efficient for UAV operation? And we found out that there are some significant differences, but also some similarities that might be used. So 
In this table, you can see the HEMS segments, uh, like I mentioned them before, station to patient, patient to station. Um, also, um, at another interesting mission, which is from hospital to another hospital. And also, of course, after talking to some HEMS operators, um, they also use helicopters to transport doctors to another hospital where they are needed from, for special surgeries or special tasks that can only be conducted by um, yeah, that specific person. Um, then there are these uh, aborted missions, the station, station flights, one leg, and of course the unknown, unknown one. And what we see here is the number of flights, uh, the median time it took uh, for the, the flight segment, uh, the median time for takeoff, median time for cruise, median time for landing, then the standard deviation of track change, uh, also for takeoff, cruise, and landing, and also the median landing area. And yeah, going going through this data, what's important? What what metrics can we actually use? So we found the patterns to characterize is that uh, we see at a patient side always this circling landing, and this also can be found here in the high standard deviation of landing uh, at a patient site. And when you take a look at more flights, you will always see this little circle, this little circle they're flying. So they first take a look at, okay, what's happening? And then they fly around the patient and then land there. Um, this is not seen uh, for, by, by hospitals or stations. There you can almost see an arc-like. So they're starting north or south or landing and flying there uh, with an arc. Um, and of course, like I said, for the aborted missions, you see this high degree turn. Uh, you can also see this in the uh, high standard deviation of the station station flight during cruise, while having uh, the standard deviation of track change from the patient to hospital flights or from the um, hospital to hospital flights almost in a straight line. So this is also useful information when you say, well, uh, the helicopter is starting at um, a hospital and flying to another hospital, then it's almost in a straight line. And you don't need to restrict your airspace to the left or right or even behind the helicopter, but it will go in a straight line. Um, and these are some of the aspects. We also find some um, yeah, uh, timely information that there are more missions during a rush hour, actually, uh, than during the night or, or evening, um, mid-day uh, times. And yeah, what, what will we do with this data? So we derived a concept for a separation strategy on how to do that. And in the end, it boils down to identifying the current flight segment. Um, like you've seen on the previous slide, we um, distinguish the behavior based on the HEM segment and on the flight segment. So we would need kind of a filter that matches the behavior of the helicopter in flight to these different segments. And if we could do that, then we could apply no-fly zones. These are so-called zones that will be um, uh, will have a, a strong impact on the future use space framework, uh, where UAVs are not allowed to fly. It. And we say, well, we, it's, it's not good to have a strict line. You can fly here, you cannot fly here. So maybe extend it with a caution volume, saying, well, if you're in that volume, please clear it. There will be a no-fly zone. So yeah, this is just kind of uh, yeah. A little idea, but we established these dynamic flying with the helicopter and static fly zones depending on the current state on the helicopter and with the metric from the broader analysis. For example, here on the right, uh, we have this little flight segment filter that we tuned for our data, um, and we have here identified the mean landing area. And we can use this, for example, if we are taking off or landing at a hospital site or at the station and say, well, here is a no-fly zone. Don't come in here. And also when landing at a patient site. So if the flight segment filter detects, oh, the helicopter is landing, then immediately this area will be blocked in a conservative way, of course. And then we're making use of this circling pattern and say, well, um, when the helicopter flies this circle, we can shrink in this little no-fly zone because the helicopter will uh, not fly out of its circle again. We know that from statistics. And also another thing that could be very helpful, so a quick win, is that the no-fly zone remains while landing at the patient side. So uh, the helicopter will land at the patient side and turn off also its ADS-B broadcast. So other UAV operators will not know that there is a helicopter, but if the no-fly zone remains there, 
everyone will be warned. And the ground operation median takes time half an hour. The maximum ground operation times that we found were one and a half hours. So it's actually very uh, significant uh, time. It can be much shorter, so you never know when it takes off. Um, but in this way, you will stay safe without restricting the airspace for a too long time. And then a very difficult uh, way to also incorporate the cruise segment is to, yeah, what we found might be worth to take a look at, uh, a dynamic cone-shaped no-fly zone in front of the helicopter, also making use of the statistics that we analyzed. And we do that by also taking a look at this standard deviation of track change, where we can derive a maximum. And when we say, well, we know where the helicopter will fly, so is it to a patient, is it to a hospital, we can narrow the angle of the cone, uh, of the bearing, uh, the bearing of the cone, and therefore also have an efficient way of restricting the airspace for UAVs. Yeah, um, like I said, these are um, get our ideas on, on how to do that, and we first focus on having this clean and complete logical data set that can be used for, for further work. This is just the very first beginning to identify the potential there. Uh, we found it very difficult to apply the filters to really say uh, where, where to draw the line. Uh, we also find out that there is a potential. So we found many patterns and we found metrics to characterize them uh, with a certain reliability, of course. And we also found a basic rule set that can be applied, for example, this ground operation uh, thing. And we uh, think that the static no-fly zones will really have a great benefit. Uh, as for today's operation, 100 meters around um, hospitals are restricted. And if it has a helipad um, on the top of the hospital, it depends on the area. Sometimes it's one and a half kilometers. Sometimes it's also just 100 meters, which is, of course, not enough. And the one and a half kilometers is too restrictive. Um, so we see some potential already with this really little analysis. And for the future, of course, we need to uh, develop further the classification algorithm to test this out in some simulations, of course, as this was just um, an, an idea, a concept, and uh, we need to refine this strategy overall, taking a deeper look into the data, how we can structure this, and of course apply to another city, as this was Berlin. Hopefully some more helicopters will have ADSB on board in the future to broaden our database, but uh, for now, this marks the end of my presentation. I would love to answer some questions. Thank you.